Uh, Matt is a nurse practitioner and psychotherapist and the founder of the Humane Clinic in Adelaide. Matt teaches and speaks nationally and internationally on humane approaches to working with people in distress. He has developed the dis dis dissociocotic uh, framework as an alternative understanding of extreme states. In May of this year, Matt led the opening of a volunteer-led community alternative for people in distress and crisis called the Just Listening Community. So I'll hand over to you, Matt, and hope everybody enjoys today's session. Thank you so much, Silvana. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to talk on suicide narratives, healing through knowing, uh, and, and really one of the sort of bylines of this approach is that the person who is suicidal is the wise person. Uh, it's not suggesting that ending our life or, 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 or anything like that is wise, but the wisdom comes from the knowing a person has in their life and their experiences that have led them uh, perhaps to experiencing suicide. So that's the kind of essence of what I'm talking about today. Before I go on, I do want to acknowledge that I'm coming from Ghana country. This, uh, the, the, the acknowledgement on the screen, you can see, I'll just read it out. It's our acknowledgement here. Humane Clinic would like to acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional owners of the lands and waters of the Adelaide region on which the Humane Clinic and Just Listening operates. We pay respects to elders past and present. We acknowledge and respect the Ghana people's cultural, spiritual, physical and emotional connection with their land, waters and community. We also acknowledge and respect respect the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and other Indigenous peoples that may be uh, represented at the centre uh, and of course today online. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about suicide, well a lot about suicide narratives, I suppose I do want to set it up, T two caveats for me, one is um, th th there is support lines around this but I, I suppose hopefully we're offering an alternative model as well uh, and that's really about being in connection, so think about reaching out, think about offering yourselves to someone else, those are kind of core tenets of this approach. Um, but also, I'm not being, I'm not, we're not attempting to be critical of individuals in their work around suicide. We've had similar models for a long time um, and evolving models in the same perspectives for a long time. And so really suicide narratives is about saying, how can we learn what we've learned and choose to move forward? And that's a big part of, of, of this approach, really. So it may feel jarring, it may not. Um, please pop some questions in if you want to ask anything. Um, and I'm happy to take questions at any time if there's burning ones, Savannah, uh, that, that feel important. So what is Suicide Narratives? Well, it, it was a model that was developed by a bunch of people, mostly with lived experience. In fact, I think all of us have lived experience of suicide, um, some in America, some in Australia, some in West, uh, South Australia, Western Australia. And we've, of course, consulted with a variety of people um, in different ways and different places. But, but in, in essence, we were unsatisfied with the way that we approach suicide. Um, and we were concerned that the, the, the deep importance of connection and understanding a person's narrative gets lost in the sort of risk-led mental health orientated environments that, that say that it's either related to mental illness or the person's a problem in some way and the stories that kind of build on that. And what gets lost in that is the, the fact that what su probably supports people most in suicidal distress that is often ongoing in people's lives uh, is actually connection uh, and, and perhaps through that connection understanding the deeply important stories that people are carrying that lead them to, to con contemplating exiting this life or ending their life and that's what I was talking about about the wisdom um, it's about sort of this idea that there's healing for the whole community uh, when we can be alongside someone who's in suicidal distress so if I if I flesh that out a little what I, what I would say would be that um, if I'm carrying a story of distress that's led me wanting to leave this life and I don't feel I can tell anyone about it, it may manifest as suicide when I express it to you or to somebody else. But actually the stories behind it are a problem for our whole community. If I've been traumatized, if I've marginalized, if I've been abused, if I've sat on the edges of society, you know, there's an opportunity for someone to join me and carry that burden with me, or maybe it can cease to be a burden if we can actually address it and this is this idea of moving away from the person being the problem towards the problem being the problem well the problem is in the whole community another thing we wanted to do was challenge the sort of institutional imperatives that we would argue create disconnection and we'll talk a bit about that 
um, and provide an ethical and theoretical justification for what Loren Mosher, the psychiatrist, called being with, not doing too. Uh, he talked about it in the context of extreme states, and I'll, I'll sort of discuss how I think we can contextualise suicide as an extreme state, more akin to what's previously been called psychosis um, than, than anything else. Um, and so then we can be with people in the same way. And importantly, I hope there's aspects of this approach that's available to everybody to facilitate and support people. So it's not for clinicians or for lived experience practitioners or for family members or for the individuals. It's, it's for all of us as a community to say, gosh, the numbers of suicide aren't going down. The distress in our communities is not reducing. It's not about COVID. It's not about mental illness. It's not a, actually this is here. Um, what can we do as a community by facing up and sharing the stories and the burdens that are in our lives that lead to suicide? Um, so some of the sort of ideas then are that the popular responses to suicide often place mental illness as, as somehow in the picture um, and or the problem person at the origin of what is actually a common human experience. Um, we, don't, we don't talk about how many of us on this call, for example, might have contemplated ending their life in a brief moment or in fact in an ongoing way, which is so common for so many of us. Um, and we don't talk about the commonalities of it like that. We talk about how many people have passed and what we need to do to stop that. But actually one of the discoveries we've made through the suicide narratives is that how many people are living in an ongoing way with suicide uh, and, and not really getting to the threshold of needing, of reaching out for support, which is where we get to the point of calling it mental illness or being, it, being a problem. But actually people are living with these deep discomforts. And it may be, um, that we, we think of people contemplating ending their life as confronting, and this is understandable. And it may be understandable that it's more comfortable to consider it within the frame of illness. However, that's not a valid construct. Um, there's a great article came out just yesterday talking about the genetics and suicide don't match up. Um, it was in Mad in America yesterday. But it, 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 and it, and it might not even be a helpful distraction to any personal community that's trying to deal with suicide to have a frame that doesn't necessarily make sense. So, um, and, and so what we would summarize is that categorizing suicide as an outcome of mental illness or a problem person has failed as an effective response. So this was a real driver for us to say, all the money, all the resources that have been lumped into suicide prevention, where are we really? Where, where are we with that? Are the numbers going down? And more importantly, are we even talking about how many of us on a day-to-day -day basis may contemplate such a thing? So we have to think about some of the underpinning ideas. And I really just use this image because it's, uh, it's a rather cool image. Um, but it, it, it might give us a bit of a clue as to some of the underpinnings of where we are at the moment and how the underpinnings aren't terribly attractive or, or looking terribly stable at some point. Um, and they've got lots of bits and pieces built on like the mud on the on the structure here. So really what's happened is we've evolved into a place of where we do what we do with suicide. But we would be questioning if you read the paper uh, of suicide narratives, wh whether there's any rationale to that, whether it is related to anything other than it's got lumped in a mental health system, therefore it's a mental health problem. We would say it's a societal issue uh, that can be supported within the community and the, the World Health Organization just this week, of course, has talked about handing back to community the narratives and the stories for healing, rather than handing them into mental health systems. And what we're saying is that a mental health system by necessity has developed responses and there's been add-ons, um, but the under, underpinning ideas are probably very out of date and could do with a bit of refreshing. So what we would say then is that um, the mainstay of suicide approaches in mental health systems and really in many of the many of the ways we work is risk assessment. Uh, and what we've done is that we've said, well, if connection is the, the single most important thing as suicide narratives would identify between two people, between communities, um, between networks, in supporting people to tell their story and formulate a meaningful narrative, we would say the greatest risk is risk of assessment. Um, and, I, and I'll sort of justify that in a little bit, but the risk of assessment, because when we, when we start filling in forms and directing people's stories from forms, which is what risk assessments ultimately turn into, um, we actually move away from connecting with the deeply important story of the individual if, if we're not careful. And I'm sure there's some of us on here that don't do that, but that is a mainstay. 
So I just wanted to justify some of the sort of shaky backgrounds and some of the mythology that comes. Um, and, and again, on here, many of you say, no, 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 it's not how we work. But it, the, the consistent story is, is that if we speak of suicide too much going into mental health services and systems around mental health services, key words trigger key responses, and particularly around sending ambulances, hospitalisation, medication, disorder labels. So talking about suicide as a bad idea is the first myth, and I think this stuff comes from um, the Alternative to Suicide mob uh, lent to me by Joe Kalaya. So actually talking shows you care and that you're willing to share the pain. So really important. Um, and we can think about then as a campaign alliance and deep listening, not risk assessment is actually what's important. So you can see the idea of deeply listening means we are going to talk about suicide. Using risk assessments, well, Dr. Matty Large here is quoted saying it's simply not possible to predict suicide in an individual patient and any attempt to subdivide patients into high and low risk categories is at best unhelpful and at worst will prevent provision of useful and needed psychiatric care. So a fairly powerful statement then. Um, and followed up by some research here that research reports 60 percent of people who died by suicide denied having suicidal thoughts to medical prof professionals so this supports this idea that we actually need to be creating environments where people can talk and share the stories safely enough will we be liable well there's some some interesting ideas around liability and suicide and 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 what we say in our clinic is that everybody is self-referring so it, it creates an important conversation on whether you can be liable for a self-referral of course in certain situations referrals aren't self-referral and we might want to question what that's around about suicide as well myth four forced hospitalization helps people while well, feeling a feeling of of powerlessness dominated my experience for mental health service. And this feeling was it is worse when I was sectioned. Sectioning replicated aspects of traumatic experience that initially caused my suicidal crisis. I felt trapped, captive and utterly out of control. I couldn't escape, uh, was, the, was the witness statement from, from a suicide crisis center. And actually elevated rates of suicide can last for up to two years after hospitalization uh, is, is what the evidence shows us. Suicide myth number five, suicidal people must be mentally ill well i've sort of talked about that but actually what we're talking about here is that people are disconnected and in deep pain unbearable psychic pain rather than having so-called mental illness and the mythology number six suicide prevention is the aim well it, it's a nice idea that we can aim towards zero suicide and i understand where that language comes from but actually being that we can't stop people ending their lives um what we we may just move to the idea of saying when you say you want to kill yourself what do you mean by that so that was a really important question when we developed suicide narratives and what is leading you to the point of wanting to die so really asking people what has happened and what is happening in your life not what is wrong with you and what do we need to change in you um, so i think they're really important tenets of where we're at and then in that respect, what we're aiming towards then is developing right understanding. And we might understand that as the reality of what is understanding without intention to change, without a goal, and with acceptance that the moment will, by the law of nature, change. So tragically, these changes end sometimes with people ending their lives, but also on many occasions um, with the right support, it changes naturally in a positive way. So suicide narratives then, that, that was the kind of background as to how we got here. So suicide narratives, then we recognise we need an immediate response. We need a crisis response. What would that look like was, was one of the questions. And then we, we got to the point of saying, okay, so, so for many people, they access services um, around suicide. But once they've accessed, accessed services, what happens after that? What, what we get sent away, we get patched up. We say we're not suicidal anymore or we feel slightly better because someone's been with us uh, and connected with us. But what happens after that? So we developed one of the ongoing responses was the suicide meaning conversation, which I'll talk to you about. Um, suicide narrative groups, which I want to acknowledge alternative to suicide groups in the States that are now coming over here. They're, they're very similar based on the same premise. I haven't done training in that, but I, I'm aware that they're very similar. Uh, and the final thing I'll talk about today will be talking with suicide, uh, which is adapted from talking with voices, the hearing voices approach. And it's a, it may be, appear controversial, but it's uh, something we're exploring and finding out about at the moment.
So what are some of the underpinning theories behind it? Well, there's this Buddhist statement of right understanding, the making sense of voices, the hearing voices approach by Professor Marius Rom and Dr. Sandra Escher is in there. Um, the power threat meaning framework, if you don't know of that, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the beginnings of an alternative to the diagnostic construct, understanding uh, people's narratives and how they are, how they are. Emotional CPR, um, which is an incredible model that's come out of uh, the National Empowerment Centre and the lived experience community around the world uh, in responding to emotional crisis and distress. Um, in my understanding of it, having trained in it and, and being a teacher of it, is that it, it's really valuable when we um, realise that we are enough to offer someone ourselves in that moment of crisis. And that might take a long time, it might take a little time. But when we move away from saying, oh, this is too big for me, you've got this illness, we sort of lose one another and disconnect. Just listening is a model developed by us here at Humane Clinic, as is dissociocotic, which I'll explain. Uh, and talking with voices, you can see there. So making sense of voices, I just wanna give this a special mention because when we developed this idea, a few of us, Oryx Cohen was in the first conversations and Andrew Fort and myself and Stephanie Mitchell and uh, Bernie Maywald and a few others and Rory, Rory Ritchie. And so we were talking about, um, and, and Suze Hutchison, we were talking about how do we um, think about the success of the hearing voice approach, which has said, if you hear voices, it's very available to make sense of the experience and live well with the experience by changing the relationship, taking the power back and, and, and understanding the social and emotional conflicts that have led to this necessary reaction. And so my thinking really was, okay, well, why don't we try and adapt that and see what that looks like in suicide? We're not really getting anywhere with suicide numbers. And as I said before, the people that live with suicide on go. So I just really want to acknowledge that incredible work, um, especially as, as, uh, Sandra Escher passed away recently. It feels a timely moment to deeply acknowledge the work. So that's an underpinning uh, model. One of the underpinning pieces then of suicide narrative was that people often describe suicide as an absorbed experience. They get very focused on it. They get drawn into it, or it's an ongoing experience that they drop into and drop out of. And we've certainly um, gathered information on this as we've done workshops and interviewed people around their voices that People, people have a story that seems to take them away from their primary moment into suicidal states. And that, and that absorption, we could argue then, is more akin to dissociation than anything else. A sort of change of consciousness as we get absorbed in this idea that this life is unbearable and that we might need to move away and we start planning and thinking and organising things in quite a ritualistic way, I would argue. So... What I've done for those of you that know about dissociocotic, I've adapted dissociocotic to, um, to suicide. Uh, and, and dissociocotic is the idea that we sort of separate ourselves from the threat by, by creating an altered state. And um, here's the image for psychosis. There's two people, one's in distress, and the trauma, dissociation, and meaning of their life gets presented externally as psychosis. So that was how it was with psychosis. And what we've essentially done is adapt it to suicide. So we've said, okay, so another way people express their trauma and dissociation and the meaning they've made of this world is through expressing and being in a state of wanting to exit this life um, and our job then perhaps as a supporter as a loved one as a connected person is not to try and get rid of that but to try and deeply understand why this is being presented as the only thing the person can think or is able to present between the two of us now over time it may well evaporate but in in the short term that's what we've got so rather than just trying to get rid of it sending people home or giving them a safety plan which you know, people will have different opinions on safety plans, but my opinion broadly is that it becomes a paper document that people are sent home with and become quite isolated with. And often isolation is, is a significant component uh, in the space of suicide. And certainly when we've been sent home with a plan and a document, we might feel quite ashamed or quite vulnerable or quite unskilled if we're not able to implement what, what the professional has told us works. So if, if it's not working for someone, it doesn't work. Um, I'm not going to go through these slides. These slides will be sent out, but this is about dissociation. You can see this online. Um, I'm just running through my slides because I want to um, get some other information. So this slide is really talking about the aim of, of sort of understanding suicide as a dissociative experience is that what we're actually aiming to do is to come back into human connection always. So people might drift off telling us 
very in, integrated and uh, organized stories about ending their life. And we can stay with them while they do that until they can start talking and we can start being back in relationship in a way that both of us might recognize more normally. And what does that do? Um, well, what it does is it creates an opportunity for people to feel connected and author or reauthor their unique human narrative more universally. Um, and, and so that's really important that if someone's talking about suicide and we can stay in connection to the point they can talk about the stories that have led them to this without fear, without threat, without vulnerability and with acceptance, then actually what you find, and I, and I can only tell you this is true if you've not experienced it, is people stop talking about suicide in the moment and stop talking about their lives. Of course, we can relate it to how they've got to the point of wanting to end this life, but actually they're talking about their deeply important stories. A little bit about the power threat meaning framework. It's, it's important that it recognizes emotional distress and troubled or troubling behavior are ultimately understandable responses to personal history and circumstances. So just as I've been saying, here's a bit of evidence to support this. It, very importantly, it restores the link between distress and social injustice. So people are distressed and wanting to end their life in the context of a variety of social injustices in their lives. And I, I presume people that have come to this workshop are, a fay with, with, with ideas around that. Um, it also increases people's access to power and resources, and certainly in suicide narratives it does that, because if you've now got a collaborator and a supporter who can hear the entire story, then you, you now have a place where you can go and talk about suicide freely, knowing that other stories will emerge, and it validates and creates validating narratives. And I can assure you that when you have these big experiences with suicide narratives, it promotes a desire for the listener to, to want to promote social action more broadly. And that's what we've seen at our clinic. Um, just to sort of bring this then into one big context of how do we do this? Well, we need to move to the idea that we're mutually human. Um, we can't have the idea if we're saying it's a natural common human reality suicide and it's a change of conscious state in the context of a world and a community that's not safe well we have to think about um not using a model such as the medical model which well-intentioned may be but the professional sees diagnosis and risk in the person's story and very quickly the person becomes the diagnosis and risk and again many of us have done this or will say we don't do this but this is what is told to us over and over again and in my clinic here no one arrives to see me who's been through the mental health system without a diagnosis uh, attached to them firmly that, that just seems to be how it is so the medical model we would argue doesn't see the person anymore, it sees the label and it sees the person as the label. We move to a trauma informed model that actually the narrative has come that there's a great deal of risk in trauma, which of course there is. And if we're not really careful, the helper does the same thing and the person becomes the sum of their trauma and the risks associated with it. And whilst the, the professional's still talking about trauma, they're actually perceiving someone as in systems as a similar risk as they would have done with a medical model. So what we're saying is suicide narratives is based in a compassion-based approach. And if we come to the other person with a deep sense of love, mutuality, and knowing that I could be you and you could be me, then we can frame our work in mutuality and human relationship. Uh, and, and that would be a way in which we can kind of develop that connection that I was talking about earlier. I just really want to acknowledge Dr. Beck Wheatley, a dear collaborator of us here at the Humane Clinic for some of this information in this compassion informed idea. So the immediate response, and I won't go on long because it's a, a very brief overview, but the immediate response then we're talking about when someone comes to us in suicidal distress is a just listening approach and emotional CPR. What, what is just listening? Well, just listening was taken from sidewalk talk in America where you put chairs at the side of the road and offer people a listening space. Uh, we developed our own version. And so really it's two people sitting or standing together and, and a listener and a person with a story to share. So it can be facilitated anywhere. And certainly the, the training group we're taking through this approach at the moment there's two people that use the bus here and they describe lots and lots of these experiences at bus stops and I think it's worth us all pausing and thinking okay so if someone talks to another member of the public about being suicidal at a bus stop how does that not end up necessarily in a mental health experience uh, in a setting well because those two people find a way to connect hopefully um, not to say people can't use mental health services, but there's many other ways here. 
Just Listening aims to demonstrate the value of connection through listening and being heard at a bus stop, in a mental health facility, anywhere really, in our own homes. And importantly, and I don't want to miss this, um, Just Listening is about offering justice both to this person narrating their personal reality and to the person listening. So it comes from some work by, um, it was inspired by some work by Dr. Leon Redler and Stephen Gans, who uh, in their book were colleagues of R.D. Lang, and they were talking in that book in some areas about the justice in the process of listening. If I really witness your story without intention to do anything with it, I can just stay with the story as, as deeply valid and important. So it's a, it's a deep listening process that can honour one another's truth. There's some free web, free videos online if you want to look at it, justlistening.com.au. Um, but the reason I included this slide, lots of people will be thinking about risk. It's all very nice. What about risk? What about risk? Of, of course, we're deeply concerned about people ending their life. Um, but we're deeply concerned about the myriad reasons that happens, uh, including so-called treatment options. Uh, and also denial of adversities and traumas and life stories, which may be confined resolution if we can dare to hear them. And I draw you to number eight, the handling strong emotions. What we would say in suicide narratives is if someone is very risky, according to modern language, listen longer, listen harder, invite them back more regularly. And I know this is challenging to our system. But if we want to offer a human rights based, social justice based, um, just service, then maybe we need to start shifting the way we think about responding to suicide. Um, and this is a question for all of us, of course, and I'm, I'm a health professional like many others here, I'm sure. What's eCPR? And we've just adapted this slightly, but it's just a moment to think about what eCPR is. As I said, it's a model that seeks to bring connection. So it seeks to bring connection, empowerment and revitalization in a moment. Uh, so it's not saying it's therapy that solves the problem. It's saying in this moment, when I'm in deep distress, I can go to you and you can offer me your heart to kind of resuscitate my emotional state, if you like. And the purpose statement then is to aspire to connect through feelings first, respecting each other as equally human, enabling us to be together without fixing, judging or imposing our beliefs and allowing us to explore the unknown together in the present moment, releasing our power to create connection. And I do acknowledge that's an adaptation. But that's what ECPR is about. And I think the things that stand out to me there is we're going to connect through our feelings first. So it gives us permission as the listener to be scared, to be frightened, to be worried, but also to share with the person goodness, this enormous story of suicide, I really feel that. I really feel that. I'm not going to do weird things to you and categorise this and tell you it's a disorder. I'm going to tell you at a very human level, I'm here with you. Uh, and, and, and as I said, it's a challenge. To summarise it, probably the easiest way, the person on the left, you can see their head and their body, their heart is separated so when you have two people overthinking and rattling off thoughts, trying to solve the problems, really, you just get two people stuck in their heads. And what they're not doing is allowing themselves to come into connection and recognising mutuality and, and commonality of living. So in ECPR on the right hand side, we would say it's important you can see the heads and hearts are connected. So we need to feel what the suicidal person, or the distressed person is saying and offer back to them that we've we've heard them, we've felt them. And I think he's on here. But. Bernard Gurin, a dear friend of ours, said, you know, it's a bit like person-centred approach, but you actually tell the person the, what the impact they've had on you in, in a helpful and hopeful way. Um, not, not burdening them, but telling them, I've experienced you when you tell me this and I'm grateful. And that's where the connection, empowerment and revitalization occurs. I'm giving a lot of information in a short time, I, I realise. Um, there's an ongoing response then, uh, suicide meaning conversations, I said, the groups and talking with suicide. And that's what I'll just uh, finish off with these things. The suicide meaning conversation then, it, what is it? Uh, it's, it's adaptation of the Hearing Voices interview, the, 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 the Maastricht interview for Hearing Voices, which has been an incredibly powerful tool for many people. It's not the answer. There's other variations of it, but it's an incredibly powerful tool for people to organize their story and make sense of and have someone believe and accept what's happened to lead them to the point of hearing voices and the relationship they have with voices. 
Um, so we adapted that and uh, a few of us got involved with this, probably, probably about six or seven of us initially. And then myself and Rory and Bernie really distilled this down into a document. So you facilitate a 10 page questionnaire. Um, of course, you can use eCPR and just listening if it's a difficult journey. However, we've probably facilitated it 30 times now and it's not been a it's not been a questionnaire that's caused great distress to people. Quite the opposite. People have found new information just by talking through how suicides evolved, emerged, become part of their life. You can develop a construct narrative if you want, um, and you can consider patterns and stories as central to the wisdom of the person surviving. So just as the person who is suicidal, we can think of them as wise because of their important stories. We, we can then take that further and say, ah, and that's the wisdom, is that they've been trying to manage these deeply painful experiences to this point, and now they're talking to us. Here's another step of wisdom by this person. So we need to honour that. What does a construct look like? We've done away with writing reports for the most part with suicide narratives now, and we just go straight to a construct. And the reason for that is that it takes away that kind of professional right. You've got to write a detailed report with all the information. No, we can bring the information back to the person in a distilled format a little bit, but, but broadly for discussion so that we can kind of look at the themes together, look at the stories together. It doesn't disempower me as a professional. It actually empowers me to walk alongside the person. It's a joy joy to do this process. You might write the construct up. Some people like that, some people don't. Um, you might use prompts of the suicide acronym, which you can see in the paper, to shape the themes and story, um, and supporting the person to follow up what's arisen for them. So part of developing the construct might be a sort of integration of going through the, the, the suicide meaning conversation in the, in the first place. Um, and, and understanding the process of telling the narrative may be the experience to work from for the person. So just the fact that this, they may not be interested in a construct because actually now they're talking about new things anyway. As I said, I'll send these slides. These slides will be available if you, I think you've got to email us, but they, they will be available. Um, and so just to say that the construct may follow the direction of what does suicide relate to? So what things does it relate to? What's the, what's the clear story that you've been telling about what it relates to? What problems does suicide cause in your life? You know, does it interrupt you going to work? Does it interrupt your relationships? Does it, does it distract you? Did it distress you? Did you associate a lot into it? What, what's the story around that? What patterns might be present? So what are the current stories that are happening that take you to suicide that relate to old stories? Um, how, how have you survived? How do you survive? What, what incredible strategies do you, do you use so that we don't start trying to get rid of things which actually might up people's risks if we want to think about risk. We can really embrace the person as being very powerful and then get into a point of someone formulating a narrative or a constructed story around their life, which is very consistent with the power threat meaning framework. So I want to talk a little bit about um, talking with suicide now and for some of you this will be unbearable some of you will be interested in it i want to just quickly give you a background i was doing a course with psychedelics today called navigating psychedelics for um, professionals and therapists and i was really exploring whether one day i might be interested in prescribing psychedelic drugs once there's available licenses i'm a psychotherapist as well so i thought well you know it's a natural inquiry I did this fantastic course with psychedelics today in the States and I we had to present a final project and mine was the development of dissociadelic as this, this idea of talking with suicide. Um, what I decided was I'm not interested in prescribing psychedelics. I think they're going to look a lot like little white tablets and silver packets for mental disorders because actually drug companies are behind a lot of the funding. Not, not all the funding, there is philanthropic funding, but there's this kind of health industry behind it. So then it got me thinking, OK, if someone doesn't want to take psychedelics, which many of us don't, how could we have a similar experience, a safer, shorter term, similar experience to, to explore what's in our mind? So Delic comes from the idea of Delos, um, manifesting, mind manifesting, and dissociate comes from dissociation. So we're talking about how do we support someone to have a to, to explore the dissociative dissociocratic state of suicide uh, intentionally in a kind of to to understand what it's what's manifesting there in their mind so forgive me for those that are more conversed in in neurobiology and um neuroscience than me but essentially what i heard was that we have a default mode network and a medium prefrontal cortex and um when there's um 
high connectivity between these two, we can get stuck in ruminating introspection without function, if you like. Um, and a decrease in connectivity occurs when there's excessive binding by psilocybin. So when you take mushrooms, it gets enormous um, serotonergic dump uh, and it sort of breaks up the connectivity between these two parts, parts of the brain. Uh, and what does that do? Well, it kind of, this is all very, very simplistic for this in this uh, workshop, but what it does is that's what kind of contributes significantly to creating the change in perceptual awareness. Um, Robin Carhart Harris, if anyone's interested, is a great guy to listen to this thing about the entropic brain that he's talking about it. Um, so the, 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 the different mode network can be seen as a sort of hub that in, includes the, hypo, the thalamus, um, the modulation of hormones in the stress response, um, and the reduced connectivity also impacts on the hypo, hippocampus, of course, the memory center. Um, so, so then we might have an extended consciousness at that point or an awareness of unconscious experiences. So what is dissociadelic? It's the intentional process of manifesting the dissociatic expressions of threat in human relationship. So when person, someone is overwhelmed in this life and the stories and threats and vulnerabilities are too much, we might come to the point where we get absorbed in ending our life. And in dissociadelic, we're intentionally trying to talk to that. We're trying to think about what that's gonna be and I'm gonna explain that in a minute. So what does it do? We probably compromise the hub and uh, prefrontal cortex connectivity, and it allows us to get into accord with how that's perceived in different ways. Uh, and then importantly, we support people coming back to safety. Um, and the basic theory here is that without those drugs, the other way we might engender that sort of serotonergic response is through a massive dump of stress in the brain of people um, so that people can have a short term experience of that. Talking with suicide is a commonly accepted model now, and there's research going on in the NHS in England, so that kind of gives me a bit of justification that all I'm really doing is creating a talking with voices experience, but about suicide. Um, there's a lot of ritual and process in it, so I'm not suggesting anyone goes and does it after this. I'm just giving you an overview of the work we're doing. But essentially, there's we're taking from the psychedelic community the idea of the set and setting, setting up an environment, setting up a relationship, and really important, the integration afterwards. So not forgetting that once someone has had a new experience of their conscious states, they're going to need to work that through. And that seems to be fairly well accepted and well considered now in the psychedelic prescribing community. Of course, we already have some psychedelics being prescribed here in various trials. There is a degree of phenomenology in this. I'll run on because I want to give you an example before we need to finish. So the other thing that I want to mention then is that this is done and broadly I'm using the compassion focus model to do this talking with voices. So we're going to induce through stress, through talking to suicide, uh, talking about suicide distinctly with a person, we're going to induce this dissociadelic psych sort of hallucinogenic state, if you like, or, or psychedelic state. Uh, and then we're going to use the human relationship to bring that back into safety. So the soothing and calm, you can see here on the green side, that's in the safe relationship. That's part of setting things up. Um, we're going to induce a threat by going to the suicide, uh, which is going to um, create this kind of process in the, in the separating of parts of the brain. And we're going to have this unusual experience and disorganization. And then we're going to use the soothing to come back into relationship. Um, I'm not going to go into great details about that. But just to say this is very intentionally very safe. Um, and the after work is really important. And so just to give you a quick uh, case study, young woman, schizoaffective disorder label, clozapine for 10 years or seven years or something like that. Um, his voice is, has experienced suicide ongoing, significant trauma and an awful lot of wisdom in her life. And um, she came to me one day when I was exploring this idea and said, how do I speak to my professionals about suicide without them detaining me or increasing my clozapine? Which I thought was a very normal and sensible question that I hear a lot of. And I said, oh, we talked to talks and I said, oh, I'm trying this new thing. Would you like to try it? So we did. And just very briefly, she described suicide as this black sludge like thing that lives inside her. And whenever she's overwhelmed, this black thing gets intense and then she starts thinking about suicide. So I got her to describe it in great detail, the sort of feeling of it, the sense of it, how it moves, how it controls things did a process of calming her down, observing her breathing, nothing terribly clever, feet on the ground, sitting on a chair, eyes closed, calm, and asked, look, we discussed what questions she would like to ask it. And then I asked suicide to leave her body. 
she described it stretching across the room and then I was able to talk to suicide and she spoke as suicide as people do in talking with voices and suicide said um, I'm not suicide I'm the emotion controller so I've gathered together all the feelings of all the traumas in this person because I think she won't be able to cope with it. Anyway, we negotiated over time for trauma, for suicide to come back into her body and to share the space within her so that she could kind of work through this stuff if she wanted to. There was a lot more to it, and I'm just giving you a snapshot. Uh, the upshot for me has been to see this young woman talk about her traumas now for 12 months in a much more available way, uh, be able to know the different traumas, do some what we might think of as classical three-phase trauma work. Uh, and that's been an absolute gift in her life. And now she can talk openly about these things. So she's kind of taken back the power. And that, I suppose, feels quite consistent with the idea of psychedelics. There may be questions about this. I won't go on because I know there's time for questions, but just to say this, the, the, the suicide narratives groups are peer uh, lived ex sorry, lived experience led groups with one or two facilitators where we basically embrace the hearing voices model. It's about discovery, discovery that we can go to a place and be accepted. There's a safe place to talk about our experiences without repercussions and that learning that the different ways other people experience suicide, reframing it. So trying out new ways of responding to suicide. And some of you will see this talks about voices because I've borrowed it from uh, Gail Hornstein and colleagues work, but we've just adapted it to suicide. Um, and, and people may negotiate new relationships with suicide if they've started talking to them. We may facilitate suicide meaning conversations there. We may facilitate talking with voices there. We may just explore how people have made sense of the reasons why they come to the point of suicide. And then there's the kind of change. So people can under, start undertaking projects in their life and coming back to the group to try things out. People may find themselves taking new chances about, oh, well, I've been told this about my suicidal experience, but I'd like to kind of try some new ways of coping with it and managing with it. And then they've got the group to come back to, to explore ideas and, and whether that's been useful or not. So it's a very safe, accepting, meaningful environment where people can work through their realities in a, in a range of different ways around suicide. Um, and I'll stop there because I want to see if there's any questions. There always is around this subject. Hi, Matt. Hi. Uh, we do have uh, quite a few questions, comments uh, have come through in the Q&A box. Yeah. Uh, um, people are keen to know if you're ever going to run this training in Victoria uh, or Queensland or many other states. Uh, so that would be good for people to know. Or do they need to come over to South Australia? Uh, look, we... Um... We do run it in South Australia. If someone wants to help us arrange it in different states, we'd be happy to. Um, but obviously, if you're in a different state, it's quite hard for me to turn up and do it. So um, we, we are considering doing an online two-day workshop. So perhaps keep an eye on our website. Great. Great, great, great. You know, I, I guess a couple of reflections that um, um, something in some of the themes that have been coming through in the questions is, mm. um, is really thinking about uh, suicide narratives and your approach thinking about a uh, social political cultural kind of yeah. injustice and some of the drivers of kind of people's experiences of disconnection and deep pain and thinking about you know uh, this is an approach for the community it's a compassion informed approach and it's sort of sort of thinking about what can we do as a community some of the people that have been commenting uh, lived experience workforce peer workers have been talking about such a great coherence with what they understand in their work, but also struggling with the, 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 the difference, the kind of the gap between uh, clinical peers uh, and the kind of gold standard of risk assessment uh, and then lived experience and peer worker workforce and knowing from a very real perspective yeah. what's helpful and what's not. Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, I'm really happy to speak on that. Uh, I want to say hello to Fern because we have an online relationship mostly and she, she's got a question inside. I hope we do get to connect to Fern. But uh, look, I think a lot of this is taken from what people are saying is peer work. However, I have a lived experience of suicide and schizophrenia labelling and all the things that come with that. And so um, I, I, I think that we can broaden this out and not say that this is defined to one group. And that's where I started. So I absolutely acknowledge the lived experience that's in this model. 
Um, and I acknowledge the, the wisdom that comes in many different professions, particularly lived experience. So my question back then, and we kind of answer it, is yes, this will feel a lot like different approaches that are already out there. And so how do we build a community to support each of us from wherever we're coming from in that way. That, that seems to be a more important question to me, not, not to everyone. And I think that answers another, there was another question on there um, from the head of the Monash Health. Yeah, uh, how to think outside Premier. the box. How, yeah, how because, do we support each other? I think, yeah. sorry, sorry, so, Savannah, I think, because that, that's that for me is the key here. If you're going to take different new alternative approaches, then getting into silos of disciplines and clinicians and non-clinicians that doesn't work. Yeah. What I want to do is say that I'm happy to work with anyone that's taking a humane approach and, a, and, a, and a, a, you know, these approaches, and I hope they might be willing to walk with me. It doesn't mean we have to agree on everything together, but we have to start seeing the ethics. And that's from psychiatrists to nurses to social workers to peer workers to family members to individuals. Um, and that, that's the way that I've found support. I, I, I would put a word of caution out there that if you suddenly start saying you want to do suicide narratives work in public and other institutional systems um, some people will feel very frightened and threatened by that and so think about where you're getting your support from your supervision from your group work where you're continually learning you know when you start talking with suicide in the way we're doing here you can imagine some people feel very uncomfortable with that well that, that's okay I feel very uncomfortable with some of the things other people do so building your networks <laughs> I, ab, ab, absolutely and, and it's also that kind of like I mean we you know in this kind of you and I together on this platform is also part of that you know VTMH we posted the kind of lifeline suicide call but we you know we posted those numbers at the beginning and at the same time, I really kind of really respect and value and kind of see all the wisdom in your work in terms of thinking about compassion and community-based approaches. Something that you said, which I wrote down, which I thought was particularly uh, you know, handing back to the community rather than handing in to mental health services. Yeah. You know, but here we are on this seminar, uh, kind of having two kind of kind of approaches at the same time in Victoria we're in a reform environment we've had our Royal Commission uh, it's kind of talked about the mental health service delivery system and you know it's really pointed out uh, a lot of things that probably we didn't need a Royal Commission to understand all yes. of the gaps and the needs it's really prioritized a human rights based model thinking about compassion based services uh, thinking about lived experience peer worker models um, yes. thinking about you know life experience equality, humanity. Uh, so in some ways, Victoria is quite ripe for bringing in uh, yeah. many more ways of being with people. Yes, yes. Um, and, and look, I think uh, I've been involved with a, a local health board in New Zealand following their Royal Commission. What, what's happening over there is the same people that led us into the problems aren't leading us out of them. And I, you know, this is probably quite political, but I do think that we need to be careful with the the outcomes of the Royal Commission over there that we're not we don't just have the same people doing the same things because actually government policy at the moment is the same people doing the same things yeah. power lies in the same place the lack of creativity lies in the same place we've increased the MBS numbers mm -hmm. which you know with respect if for the most part if you go to someone on the MBS and tell them about deep intense suicidal experiences you're going to get passed on. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hopeful and excited and also honestly fairly sceptical um, yeah. about how we can move forward in that way. I mean, I, I, I sincerely hope we can. Um, I, I did want to speak to um, a question that was up there about youth. Um, yeah, I, we're on the same wavelength. Uh, yeah, go for I mean, it. You know, young people are talking about suicide far more skillfully than adults. In my experience, mm. my 12 year old daughter tragically comes home from school talking about kids talking about suicide mm. and not knowing whether she's allowed to talk to me about it or not because of what yeah. I'll do. So it's the same dilemma that we're breeding into another generation of people. Mm. And so we are, we've just been invited to go and do eCPR with kids in a school uh, in country South Australia. And we're going to take a bit of a leap and go and do that. But my view is, is that Oh, no, not my view. My thoughts are that maybe we could think about upskilling children as young as 12 to support one another and the adults could be a kind of um, invited supervision space. Mm. 
uh, by the children rather than us have to play the primary roles. Um, yeah. Because if you look at youth services, behind that is a bunch of, if I can be so bold, mostly white middle-aged men of yeah. which I'm fast approaching. Well, that doesn't yeah. relate to a to a 12-year-old in a school in South Australia right now. So how do we again hand not the responsibility, but the, the creativity and deep knowings of these young people. How do we be brave is my question. I, I, I think this is a really important uh, point because also what we're seeing is a is a in Victoria at least there's been a large investment of mental health funding into school systems, mm. but in in some ways what we're seeing is a, a, a clinical model being imparted into school systems, and so we've yeah. got a whole lot of young people that are somewhere yeah. else. They're on Discord, or they're in their kind of uh, gaming chat rooms talking yeah. about. Uh, their stories and their stories about distress and disconnection. And yeah. then we have this other sort of parallel universe run by adults happening alongside them. And how, how do we actually um, um, have the trust, I think, in a process that can actually uh, include young people as equal, value, yeah. valuable participants in their internal stories? Yeah, and it's, 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 it seems to be so challenging. And I think this model is another challenge to the dominant discourses. I mean, there's another question from Kay, hey Kay, um, at Wellways, um, and she's talking about how this has been experienced from people from different cultural backgrounds and learning from this. Well, I don't have a vast experience. We've only done two two-day workshops on this, so 40-odd people um, and various short courses. But um, certainly a dear friend of ours, um, Anulama Nick and a woman, was very... Um, proactive and uses it in her community now uh, and then also um, the Spanish South American speaking community in Adelaide went away and translated the document into their language because they found it of so much value so I think one of the things I'd say about suicide narrative take what you want from it and don't take what's not bearable to you you know go and be your best self by taking the different facets and that also relates to Melanie Quinn's question about or statement about it being similar to different thera psychotherapy models. Yeah, there's lots of psychotherapy models in this. So that's a really fair point. We are psychotherapists. We come from a psychotherapy position. Um, and so what, what we're actually saying here at Humane Clinic is that we think it's possible to run a non-medical, non-pathologizing mental health service here. So we have an emergency department alternative run by the community. We have a psychotherapy service. We have hearing voices and suicide narrative groups. And we have education here uh, and, and hopefully in the next couple of years we'll open a Soteria house and all of it will, it's not about anti-medicine or anti, but it is about saying we don't need to pathologize people. And so how do we support that with good knowledge, good skills and, and social justice movements? Yeah. And, you know, we don't need to pathologize. Leading with feelings is, is a is a great beginning. This, there is something unusual that happens, I think, in our mental health system where um, we talk about everything but the feelings uh, and this idea of uh, just the over-reliance on thoughts and cognition. Mm. I'm a somatic therapist outside of VTMH. <laughs> so, you know, this is like bringing the body in, bringing the heart in, uh, bringing the kind of human-to-human -human kind of experience in mm. and thinking about, um, you know, I guess as a unit at VTMH, we talk a lot about thinking about what are the drivers of marginalisation I really like the just listening is 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 multiple meanings, you know, just as in justice listening yeah. uh, and just as in being present uh, and really yeah. prioritising those. And that's, you know, just on that, it's, we train volunteers over six weeks in just listening, which includes suicide narratives, dissociocotic, path threat, meaning framework, eCPR. Um, the most interesting thing, most, not most, a good proportion of these people are just lay members of the community. They're not peer workers or clinicians or anything like that. Even the community need to unlearn yeah. what they've unconsciously learned. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating seeing people wanting to fix other people who aren't broken. Yeah. Uh, and these aren't professionals. So this isn't a, this isn't a session to tell, tell ourselves off as professionals. It's about yeah. saying, oh, as a wider community, we've arrived at this very strange position. Yeah. And, you know, I'm doing a push-up challenge this year for suicide. Never done a push-up before in my life. 3,318 push-ups or something. That number hasn't, according to the government's own data, hasn't significantly shifted since 2005. Yeah. And that is a tragedy. That yeah. is a, and, and then the amount of people that live with this experience day in, day out, and we never even know. We never know because they don't go to services. Yeah. 
So we need to build this resource within our communities. Yeah. So that, you know, the person at the bus stop can tell me, I, I don't know if I can go on. Could you miss this bus and spend five minutes with me? Yeah. Yeah, I can miss this bus. If, that, yeah. if, that, if that's the difference in our society, I'll do that every day. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting that the the somewhere early in your talk, just having that statement that you made, like, we're enough to respond, you know, and then mm. some of the comments, people saying, you know, uh, kind of the caution, you know, about people feeling responsible if they start a conversation around suicide narratives, then somehow that person's life becomes your responsibility. And, but, mm-hmm. you know, aren't we responsible to each other anyway? Uh, yeah. You know, in a, in a in a humane connected society, you know, we are responsible for each other. Yes. Um, yes. It does the conversation make us more responsible? You yeah. know, it's uh, it, that maybe that's part of the unlearning. The some of the things that we've internalized in terms of the way, uh, as a broader society, we approach the idea. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm glad you've clarified that because just before I came on, one of the reasons I was late today was a guy just walked into our building because we're open in the evenings to the public for free walking. Mm-hmm. We're not open, yet, but he walked in. And so I spent half an hour with him chatting. I'm not sure I'm any more responsible for him than I was an hour and a half ago. Yeah. But I feel I, I feel better about myself yeah. having sat down and just quietly listened to this guy. Yeah. And, and I hope he might feel better for having been listened to. It's, that's not about responsibility of what happens next. That's about yeah. responsibility in the moment. Yeah. Just being present. And, um, yeah, it's a great, great privilege. So. I know we're running out of time. We, I, I don't want to forget to say to thank you to you. Run over time. Yeah, yes. Thank you to you and your team for having me and giving me a platform to speak on these subjects and discuss uh, to all of you behind the scenes. I'm really grateful. So. Well, we're incredibly grateful that you um, share your time with us mm-hmm. uh, and really happy to kind of use the VTMH platform to be able to uh, communicate um, the unknown together and multiple yeah. ways of knowing. And I guess that's really fundamental to some of the work of VTMH is thinking about cultural humility. No one is an expert in someone else's life experience or story and that there are cultivating the capacity to sit with the unknown and the not knowing uh, yeah. and the yeah. never knowing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And still be able to actually show up, be present. We don't need to find answers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, Matt, anything else you want to say before we end the session? Thank you. And thank you to people that tuned in to listen. I think, um, yeah, we can learn a lot from each other around this world. So thank you. Absolutely.